Welcome back. Our Adam Johnson is reporting live today from the BMO Metals and Mining Conference in Hollywood, Florida. Adam's already had interviews with the CEOs of Kinross Gold and Freeport McMoran. AJ now has the CEO of the world's third largest gold producer. Adam? Hey, thanks, Mark. Yeah, of course, we're talking about Anglo Ashanti and Mark Kudafani, CEO, thank you for joining us. So as I'm talking to investors down here, a lot of the guys make the point that your company is one of the most aggressive companies exploring for gold. Explain what that means. Well, we've spent a lot of money. This year, we've got $300 million allocated to exploration. We've been very successful in the last seven years, being the most successful major explorer uh, through that period. So uh, had a lot of success. We're going to back the guys to have more success. Now, when they talk about exploring for new gold, you're really going after gold that, at this point, has not yet been discovered. Yes, uh, we're extending those areas that we do know very successfully, and we're also in new areas that uh, we're not sure if there's gold there, but certainly our guys believe there should be. And you get a higher or a bigger bang for the buck when you go that route, as opposed to buying already established mines? Oh, we think so. On average, we've delivered gold into the portfolio at about $30 an ounce, compared to what people are paying now, three, five, a thousand dollars an ounce. So Say that again, $30 an ounce? $30 an ounce, 70 million ounces, $30 an ounce compared to competitors who are paying up to a thousand dollars an ounce. So we're doing very well. So you're willing to pay more up front because you ultimately get that low cost basis if you find something. If you've got the best people and we believe we've got the best people and the results uh, prove it. Now what's the, the, the one property you're most excited about right now? Well, there's a number of them. Uh, we've got a new development, Tropicana, in Australia. We're doing some great things in Brazil, Carrillo de Situ, new project there. Argentina's doing very well. We've got a whole range of them all through Africa and other parts of the world. Okay, now, you also decided to stop hedging back in 2010. That's been one of the themes here. Nobody wants to hedge, but are we just all whistling past the graveyard thinking gold's going to go up and up and up? Well, if you look at gold now, it costs more than $1,000 an ounce across the industry to produce an ounce of gold. That's when you take exploration project development and operating costs. And so at $1,400 an ounce, yes, there's a bit of a margin, but I wouldn't call it bubble territory. So at what point do you say, wait a minute, guys, let's put the hedges back on? Uh, in our case, we don't. We believe that if we run our costs well, keep ourselves in the bottom half of the cost curve, then we shouldn't revert to hedging because we're confident in the, in the product we sell. In other words, you want to just keep finding more gold and, and manage the cost that way and give yourself the upside. Absolutely, and we've tripled, tripled our free cash flow generation in the last three years through operating improvements, discovering gold at the right cost, and delivering on uh, the potential we have with the price. So when hedge fund guys say you're one of the most aggressive explorers and you're willing to pay up, that doesn't bother you? No, I think they're just saying we're very astute. Ah, all right. Let's talk about South Africa, where it's difficult to mine. You've got works stoppages, the supply of electricity, you've got uh, overlapping mine rights in some cases. How do you deal with the risks of South Africa, which is 40% of your revenue base? Well, firstly, I'd make the point, we've not had a mine stoppage in our operations for more than seven years, so we've had no problems with uh, industrial activity. From an energy point of view, we've cut our energy consumption by 15%, which has reduced our costs. We've had no problems with energy supply in the last three years. So even when utilities a couple of years ago in South Africa were being shut down, you were still able to operate the mines? No, we were shut down for a couple of days, but at the end, because we've made the changes we've made, we think we've insulated ourselves from that risk effectively in the country. And by the way, I'm part of the energy users group that's advising the government on how to improve that situation, so I'm very optimistic. There are still pressures there, but I think as a country we can manage those risks. And from a licensing point of view, we've not had any problems. It's really a matter of dialogue, understanding your position and managing that position well, which is no different, in my view, to doing business anywhere else in the world. Now, what about some of the mines that have overlapping rights? Is that an issue for you at all? Well, you see that all around the world. I'm surprised that people get so upset with the current South African situation. I think it's right for South Africans to be concerned because they've not had that problem in the past, but you see it all over the world. So at the end of the day, we've got to sort that through. There's a strategy with the government over the next six months to get that sorted, and I believe we'll get it sorted out. 